Hello, YouTube. In 1847, Karl Marx published a series of essays called Wage, Labor, and Capital, and it is considered to be his precursor to Capital, a monumental treatise on labor relations and economies. I first read these essays when I was 21, and although I've read many other Marxist writings since then, this one was definitely the most accessible and influential. Wage, labor, and capital explains some really fundamental contradictions inherent in capitalism that seem obvious, and yet, this was the first time I had ever read or thought about them. I'm going to talk about some of Marx's arguments in these essays and why their radically simple yet profound nature make them a great tool for revolutionizing the working class. As usual, I will include the transcript for this video in the description below. Like all good arguments, Marx first establishes some necessary definitions. Wages are the amount of money which this capitalist pays for labor power, a certain period of work or for a certain amount of work. Marx differentiates between labor, what humans have always done for survival, and labor power, which is what a worker sells to an employer. When a worker does labor, they have the power to decide their own work and to keep the products of that labor. Labor power, in contrast, is sold to the employer, and the employer decides the type of labor and keeps the products of that labor. There's a reason Marx is making this distinction. If the capitalist employer can buy labor power, then labor power must be a commodity like any other. Marx gives the example, with the same amount of money with which the capitalist has bought their labor power, for example, with two shillings, he could have bought a certain amount of sugar or of any other commodity. The two shillings with which he bought 20 pounds of sugar is the price of the 20 pounds of sugar. The two shillings with which he bought 12 hours use of labor power is the price of 12 hours labor. Labor power then is a commodity, no more, no less so than is sugar. The first is measured by the clock, the other by the scales. From this, Marx deduces that wages, therefore, are only a special name for the price of labor power. It is a special name for the price of this peculiar commodity, which has no other repository than human flesh and blood. Marx then compares the cost of sugar to the cost of labor power, concluding that labor power, like any other commodity, can be bought and sold. Therefore, labor power must be a commodity within the capitalist system, and the value of any commodity when expressed in currency is called its price or exchange value. There is no significant differences in two commodities of equal exchange value, as both can be bought and sold on the market. However, exchange value is not the only type of value. Marx distinguishes this idea from use value, the ways in which a commodity can actually satisfy human needs. The use value of a loaf of bread, a coat, a house, etc. remains the same, whereas the exchange value can be manipulated. Why is this definitional argument important? Well, it presents an honest view of the role of labor in an economy. Even in a capitalist society, workers tend to think of labor as separate from other commodities, but functionally it's not. The capitalist employer does not treat them differently and only calculates his purchase based on what is needed to produce a product at a profit. The visceral language of human flesh and blood should disturb the audience because in capitalism, the role of the workers are as commodified as the raw materials and machinery they work with. Labor power is just another commodity to be bought and sold at the best price. And like a commodity, a worker has no more share in the product of his labor than the raw materials or machinery that were used to create it. Furthermore, the laborer is not paid the use value of his work. Instead, they are paid the exchange value, whatever can be had on the market. Marx gives a brief analysis of labor and labor power throughout history, where he writes, Labor power was not always a commodity. The slave did not sell his labor power to the slave owner any more than the ox sells his labor to the farmer. The slave, together with his labor power, was sold to the owner once for all. He is a commodity that can pass from the hand of one owner to that of another. He himself is a commodity, but his labor power is not his commodity. The serf sells only a portion of his labor power. It is not he who receives wages from the owner of the land. It is rather the owner of the land who receives a tribute from him. The free laborer, on the other hand, sells his very self, and that by fractions. He auctions off 8, 10, 12, 15 hours of his life one day like the next to the highest bidder, to the owner of raw materials, tools, and the means of life, i.e. to the capitalist. In capitalism, the worker himself is not the commodity, but rather sells parts of himself as a commodity. 
The worker is therefore advantage over the slave because he can profit off of the sale of his labor. However, the effects of the commodification of labor power results in a loss of meaning in the work for the worker. And the laborer who for 12 hours long weaves, spins, bores, turns, builds, shovels, breaks stone, carries hods, and so on, is this 12 hours weaving, spinning, boring, turning, building, shoveling, stone breaking, regarded by him as a manifestation of life, as life? Quite the contrary. Life for him begins where this activity ceases, at the table, at the tavern, in bed. The 12 hours work, on the other hand, has no meaning for him as weaving, spinning, boring, and so on, but only as earnings, which enable him to sit down at the table, to take his seat in the tavern, and to lie down in a bed. Since the worker, who creates some good or service with their labor power, has no relationship to the final product, they derive no meaning from the labor, except as it pertains to the price, their wages. Commonly called worker alienation, it results in the living for the weekend mentality, in which work is only done to survive and to continue working. Marx uses the analogy, if the silkworm's object in spinning were to prolong its existence as a caterpillar, it would be a perfect example of a wage worker. For the rational worker, the only way to maximize value from their situation is to either work more or for better wages. So, how are those wages determined? So, wages are just a specific type of price. And Marx outlines three ways in which price is determined. One, competition between sellers. Sellers want to sell the most of their product, and ideally they want to be the only seller in the market. Thus, sellers compete for the lowest price by driving the price down. Two, competition between buyers. Buyers compete against each other and this drives the price up in much the same way. Three, competition between buyers and sellers. If there are more buyers than sellers, the price rises with demand and if there are more sellers than buyers, then the price will lower with supply. Marx points out that the price of a given commodity is useless without the context of other commodities and that these prices correspond to balance each other out in times of fluctuation. If, for example, the price of a yard of silk rises from two to three shillings, the price of silver has fallen in relation to the silk. And in the same way, the prices of all other commodities whose prices have remained stationary have fallen in relation to the price of silk. The only real way to measure the highness or lowness of a price of a commodity is to compare it against its cost of production. Marx rejected the idea that price always reflected production costs and argued, but it is precisely these fluctuations which, viewed more closely, carry the most frightful devastation in their train, and, like an earthquake, cause bourgeoisie society to shake to its very foundations. It is precisely these fluctuations that force the price to conform to the cost of production. Since wages are an extension of price, Marx applies the same rules. Wages will now rise, now fall, according to the relation of the supply and demand, according to the competition as it shapes itself between buyers and labor power, the capitalists, and the sellers of labor power, the workers. He has already established one value of labor power, that is, it has an exchange value on the market. Now he explains the other way to calculate the cost of labor power, the cost of maintaining the laborer as a laborer, and for the education and training required for the labor, as well as the wear and tear for the instruments of labor and the laborer himself. Marx clarifies that this is true for the race of workers, not the individual, as many individuals work for less than survivable wages. However, the capitalists do not need the individual laborer to survive and propagate only the class of laborers as a whole. Now that we have an understanding of these components, Marx shows how they fit into a capitalist system. He begins by defining capital. Raw materials, instruments of labor, and means of subsistence of all kinds which are employed in producing new raw materials, new instruments, and new means of subsistence. Marx notes that not all raw materials and instruments of labor are capital. They can be capital under certain social conditions. For example, a piece of wood used by an artisan to craft a table in 14th century France is a raw material, but it's not capital. Wood only becomes capital when it is used by wage labor to produce a commodity that will be exchanged on the market for money, which is accumulated and controlled by the capitalist. In the same way, if a laborer works for a personal or communal project, or if the capitalist takes his profit and spends it on personal consumption, then that becomes no longer capital as well. Capital is not only the means of subsistence, instruments of labor, and raw materials, not only as material products. 
it consists just as well of exchange values. All products of which it consists are commodities. Capital, consequently, is not only a sum of material products, it is a sum of commodities, of exchange values, of social magnitudes. And because of the competitive nature of the system, the capitalists will always aim to preserve and multiply the exchange value of their commodities through any means. So, capitalists are competing to preserve and multiply the exchange value of their commodities. Capitalists have only one way to increase the exchange value of their commodities. If you look back to the definition of capital, it is obvious where all the parts of this system originate, in labor. All commodities are made of raw materials, tools of labor, and labor power. And the raw materials and tools are just products of earlier accumulated labor. The capitalist system requires a class dedicated to labor, and capitalists must exploit that labor to survive and grow. So consider the following example. For one shilling, a laborer works all day long in the fields of a farmer, to whom he thus secures a return of two shillings. The farmer not only receives the replaced value of which he has given to the day laborer, he has doubled it. For the one shilling, he has bought the labor power of the day laborer, which creates products of the soil of twice the value, and out of one shilling he makes two. The day laborer, on the contrary, receives the place of his productive force whose results he has just surrendered to the farmer, one shilling, which he exchanges for means of subsistence, which he consumes more or less quickly. The one shilling has therefore been consumed in a double manner, reproductively for the capitalists, for it has been exchanged for labor power, which brought forth two shillings, unproductively for the worker, for it has been exchanged for the means of subsistence, which are lost forever, and whose value he can obtain again only by repeating the same exchange with the farmer. Capital, therefore, presupposes wage labor. Wage labor presupposes capital. They condition each other. Each brings the other into existence. So in this example, the farmer owns the capital involved in all of the production, the fields, the tools, and the labor power once he has purchased it. He is a capitalist, and his goal is to maximize the exchange value of his commodities. The products of labor can be sold for more on the market relative to the labor power, and so the farmer is compelled to buy labor power again and again, to sell the products at a profit again and again. Marx concedes this relationship is not always harmful to the laborer. If the surplus value, the difference between the cost of raw materials, tools, and labor power, and the cost of the final product, can be increased, then the capitalist system will expand into this new industry, and the increased demand in labor power will result in a higher wage or price for that commodity. But it still remains that the capitalist has only one way in which to increase his profit, by selling the final product for a higher exchange value than the labor by which it was created. So here is how a capitalist will calculate the selling price of a commodity. The selling price of the commodities produced by the workers divided, from the point of view of the capitalist, into three parts. First, the replacement of the price of raw materials advanced by him, in addition to the replacement of the wear and tear of the tools, machines, and other instruments of labor likewise advanced by him. Second, the replacement of the wages advanced. And third, the surplus left over, i.e. the profit of the capitalist. It is this third part with which we are most concerned, since this is the profit margin upon which the entire capitalist system rests. While the price of commodities may rise and fall, labor power included, they will never rise relative to this surplus or profit. Marx explains, real wages may remain the same, they may even rise. Nevertheless, the relative wages may fall, and yet the capitalist is always able to profit, and the worker cannot. Let us suppose, for instance, that all means of subsistence have fallen two-thirds in price, while the day's wages have fallen but one-third, for example, from three to two shillings. Although the worker can now get a greater amount of commodities with these two shillings than he formerly did with three shillings, yet his wages have decreased in proportion to the gain of the capitalist. The profit of the capitalist, the manufacturers for instance, has increased one shilling, which means for a smaller amount of exchange values which he pays to the worker, the latter must produce a greater amount of exchange values than before. The share of capital in proportion to the share of labor has risen. The distribution of social wealth between capital and labor has become still more unequal.
This pattern continues even in the reverse when markets are good. If, for instance, in good business years, wages rise 5%, well, profits rise 30%, the proportional, the relative wage, has not increased, but decreased. There's no market condition under which wages may rise relative to profits or the price of commodities, because any capitalist who would do so would surely go out of business. The end result, no matter how successful the capitalist expansion is, is that if capital grows rapidly, wages may rise, but the profit of capital rises disproportionately faster. The material position of the worker has improved at the cost of his social position. The social chasm that separates him from the capitalist has widened. As stated before, capitalists are incentivized to sell the most product at the cheapest price to drive out competitors. There are a few ways to do this. Capitalists aim to further enlarge the workforce and thus have a constant supply of disposable labor. But the productive forces of labor is increased above all by a greater division of labor and a more general introduction and constant improvement of machinery. The larger the army of workers among whom the labor is subdivided, the more gigantic the scale upon which 20 machinery is introduced, and the more in proportion does the cost of production decrease, the more fruitful is the labor. And so there arises among the capitalists a universal rivalry for the increase of the division of labor and of machinery and for their exploitation upon the greatest possible scale. This division and specialization of labor and the constant drive for higher productivity results in even more worker alienation. So this is about the end of the essay with Marx just ending questioning the future of industries as they grow even more expansive and more automated. He even worries about a new credit system and the increasing prevalence of economic crises to come, which is actually kind of prophetic. So why do I think these arguments are really useful? Well, I like that they present a really easy to follow logical chain. Labor power is bought and sold on the market. Therefore, it is a commodity like any other. And the commodification of labor power results in worker alienation. Capitalists must maximize profit by selling commodities at a higher rate than labor power and the products of labor used in the creation of those commodities. So, wages are always going to fall relative to the price of commodities, and this is going to widen the gap between the capitalists and the workers. This problem is exacerbated by market fluctuations, automation, endless expansion, and more.